I went to the hospital this afternoon after our Bible classes were over and I visited with Sister Elaine Hovatter for, for a few minutes and some members of her family and I asked her, she was laying there in the bed, relaxed and very alert. And I, I, said, I said, Sister Hovatter, what happened to you this morning? And she looked at me just as serious as she could be and she said, you put me to sleep. And I said, well, do you want to hear what you missed while you were asleep? And she said, no. She said, maybe I'll listen to the recording later. So she was quite sharp, quite witty, and uh, as of this afternoon was doing a, a whole lot better. And we thank God for her. We thank God for people that tend to people like her. Thank you for being here tonight as we think about the kind of people we have been, and we think about the kind of people we're going to be as we move forward into a brand new year. <laughs> this morning, talked about how we need to congratulate ourselves, and they'll do a brief review of, uh, of some things on the, on the board behind me, a brief review of some of the things we tried to cover this morning, but we did talk about how we do need to congratulate ourselves because we've made it. We've made it, maybe we barely made it, but we've made it into a new year with new opportunities and we are thankful for that. Also, talked about how different folks have different resolutions and, and you would guess what <coughs> some of the main ones are about losing weight and stopping smoking and do better with money management and those kinds of issues. And then we talked about the various resolutions and decisions, commitments that we children of God need to be making, things like praying more, reading the entire Bible this year, and worshiping more, and having family devotionals, and, and doing a lot of good things like that. And then whenever we were kind of wrapping up some things this morning, we are focusing together on how we, how we move the resolutions from, from a dream into reality. To, to a plan, to actually executing the plan and mention how we need to have realistic expectations. If we, if we keep shooting at something that's beyond our grasp, we're always going to fail. But of course, if we, if we aim at nothing, we're going to hit that every time also. So we need something we'll aim at that we really can with God's help and the encouragement of good people that we can hit. We need to plan to do things that with God's help we will actually do. You remember... Jesus said one time, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. So we've got to move beyond the Lord help me to do this, and I want to do this, and I'm planning to do this, to actually getting it done. Remember, one man wishes for fish, another man fishes for fish. Who catches the fish? It's the person who's out there actually trying to execute the plan. And so we need to have realistic goals in mind, then go out with God's help and accomplish those things. We need to involve God in the process, need to tell him every day, need to ask him every day to help us in, in putting actually his program. You know, when, when I thought about the resolutions I want to have for my life, I realized I don't have to be real creative in these things. I can just go to the Bible and it's already there. It's already there what I ought to be doing, these things like praying more and reading the Bible more and being more evangelistic and being more generous and, and all those kinds of things. So it's God's plan to begin with. I just need to let him know that I'm on board and I want to do these things and I really, really need your help, Father, in order to get it done. Need to involve other people. Other people can be such a, an encouragement. Other people can help hold us accountable. We all do better when we're being watched. And so if we got some people watching us and, and rooting us on, we're going to be more successful. We need to keep records, maybe write down the goals and then check them off as they are accomplished. We need to be as motivated later in the year as we are today. We need to have certain rewards for ourselves. We need to believe that these things are achievable. If you can believe it, some people would say you can do it. If you can dream it, you can achieve it. Some people even would say, and there's a lot of truth to this, that God would not put within us a desire to do something that's good and withhold from us the ability to do that we, we desire to do that is so good, that is such a blessing for us, a blessing for others, right? If he's given us the dream, he's given us the ability to achieve the dream. And then we need to talk some now about what this Hebrew writer would say and 
Colby read this earlier. Let's hit it one more time now. It really is important. This will be the, the launching point as we go through tonight's very important study. As we think about God's will for us, our will for us, and we need to match our will with his always. But here's what the Hebrew writer would talk to us about. Remember, everybody just about that we know has as one of their goals losing weight. Well, the Hebrew writer wants us to lose weight also of another kind. This is Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and probably he's talking about the folks in, in Hebrews 11 that have run the race, they set the goals, they had the grand resolutions, and they accomplished what they set out to accomplish, and, and now they've handed the baton on to us, and they're watching to see how we do, that we not drop the baton, that we be victorious as they were victorious. And so we got all these people cheering us on, he says then that let us lay aside every weight, not a lot of the weight, not most of the weight, every weight, every weight. Get rid of this dead weight and the sin which so easily ensnares, so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance. So stick with it. Let's finish this. Finish the race that is set before us. Where is it set before us? In the scriptures. Verse 2. What are we to do as we run? Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. In the original, the idea there is that he's our trailblazer, he's our pioneer, he's taken that machete and he's cleared the path for us. It's much easier now for us to follow as long as we stay on the trail that he prepared for us. He's the author, he's the finisher of our faith. What else? Who for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? Endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of of God. So it's time to lose some weight, lose some sin. So how do we do that? Well, the Hebrew writer just told us. He told us to do it, then he tells us how to do it. One is we think about these witnesses. We think about their victories. We think about their successes. We think about their, their cheering. You know, what's the saying? Man cannot live by bread alone. Sometimes he needs a little buttering up. And so we've got these witnesses. We've got these folks. We've got this applause of heaven. It helps us to sustain the effort. And then secondly, we learn from this particular passage, if it is weighing us down, if it's, if it's slowing us as we're racing towards heaven, we need to delete it. We need to get rid of it. We need to separate ourselves from it. And there is some self-denial involved in this, of course. You remember studying in school is kind of bizarre, bizarre custom that some cultures have had distant cultures of ancient days. If they caught you killing somebody, they'd take that dead body and they would shackle you to that dead body. And that would be part of your punishment. That you would literally have this dead weight that you'd be dragging around with you. And, and the, the analogy here that the Hebrew writer is not identical to that, but it is similar to that. You can't run the race carrying that dead weight. You can't be a successful Christian. You can't be blessed. You can't be a blessing to others if you're carrying all these other burdens, all these other sins that are distracting us, that are slowing us down, that are keeping us from getting to the final destination. So first of all, we're encouraged by those witnesses. And let's, by the way, be witnesses to each other. Good witnesses, positive witnesses. You know, we can, we're going to go out in the world later tonight, certainly by tomorrow, and we're going to meet people that will be anxious to criticize, to condemn, to, to disrupt our progress. And we've got to have some balance to that. And the balance is the body of Christ. We need to be that, that rallying point for people. We, we need to be the people who are encouraging. Remember how the Hebrew writer put it, in Hebrews 10, we're to be the ones who are provoking one another to love and to good works. May I ask you, make a list, in your mind at least, who you've been provoking lately. Not provoking to anger, not provoking to agitation or aggravation, but who have you, who have we, make it about me too, who have we been provoking to help them do good? Not who we've been putting down, not who we've been nailing to the wall. But, but who have we been provoking unto love? Who have we been cheering on? Who have we been stimulating? Who have we been inspiring? Who have been refreshing? Uh, if, if I were to ask, 
Everybody write down now the name of somebody that has encouraged them. Write down, think of it at least in your mind. Somebody that's encouraged you lately to live a more faithful life, a more blessed life, a better life. Would, would anybody write your name down as the person that has been an encouragement to them? Who would be writing your name down? Not just think about whose name we'd be writing down that's encouraged us, but who would be writing Jeff's name down or your name down and say, this person helps me live a better life. This person's helping me get to heaven. Be that. We think about the witnesses who are cheering us on, who are rallying us towards the cross. But let's also be that kind of person for others. And then we run. We run. What did the Hebrew writer say? Let us run. Let us get moving. Christianity, as I mentioned this morning, is a Christianity that has some remarkable verbs in it. Not so many nouns in it. There are a few, but it's basically a belief system that is saturated with verbs. Verbs are, are words of action. Christianity is something that we do. It's not something that we just watch others do. It's something that we enjoy. That's a great verb. In Christianity, we serve. That's a great verb. In Christianity, we love. That's a great verb. In Christianity, we, we pray. That's a good verb. In Christianity, we read. That's a good verb. In Christianity, we believe. That's a good verb. There are just so many good verbs, and we need to be verbing all the time. We need to be busy doing the things like the folks in Hebrews chapter 11 did and doing the things like other folks who've gone before us in this community have done. How did it come to be this great congregation? Not because of nouns, but because of verbs and people who were active, people who were vi busy, people who were who were fulfilling the resolutions that God decided long ago should be done. So, we're encouraged by the witnesses. And we encourage others as we are their witnesses. And then also we get rid of the things that drag us down, slow us down, cause resistance for us. And then we run. We get moving. We, we stay moving. And the hardest part of all this in it is to get moving, is to get going is to start the doing of it. You know, spe have, some of you, you've had, your, you've had your, your arms in sling or something in a cast, and, and it's been immobilized for a while, and then whenever you take that cast off or you move that sling and, and you try to move, doesn't the body just protest? I mean, the, the muscles actually have begun to atrophy. They, they've begun to deteriorate some, through, not through overuse, but through underuse. And so when we first start moving, the, there's this great pain, there's this great discomfort, and it makes us want to stop moving. It's the same with serving, unfortunately. It works that way. Sometimes we're, we're so stagnant, we're so stuck, we're in a comfort zone, it just feels good. And when we launch out, it, it can be, you know, work. can be work. It, it can be a challenge for us, an effort. And, and some of these verbs... If, if we haven't been busy doing these things, then we're going to have a spirit about us that's going to just protest and say, no, I don't think so. That's what we pay him to do. That's what their elders for. They're the Bible. You know, that, it's for the spiritual people. No. It's for people that follow Christ, and, and that's us. So let's get moving with these verbs. And then you notice also the Hebrew writer would tell us to look to Jesus as we're trying to live this kind of life where we're trying to get rid of this bad weight and replace it with good weight, we look to Jesus. What did Jesus do? He increased. Remember, uh, John the Baptist even said of him, he must increase as I must decrease. And, and so how did Jesus increase? Well, a lot of ways, obviously. Don't have enough time tonight to list all of them. But remember in, in Luke chapter 2, the end, of the, the end of the chapter there, he's been lost, been separated from mom and dad for a time in the city of Jerusalem, and they find him, and, and there's, a, there's a good reunion, and he goes and he agrees to be subject to them, and the text tells us, remember, that he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man. And one of the things that's almost so shocking to me about that particular passage is that he is the son of God, he's perfect, he's never done anything wrong, and he actually increased in favor with God, with his Father. 
Things got even better as time went along between Jesus, the Son of God, and his Father in heaven. And that tells us, doesn't it, that, that we never reach a point where we can't be increasing in favor with God, where things can't get better. We know, we understand very easily that, that there are always things we can do to increase in favor with our fellow man, to be a better servant, to be a better example, to be a better peacemaker, and all those things, but actually, if Jesus could improve his relationship with God in some ways, if he can increase in favor, then surely we also can increase in favor with God. When we become like Jesus, we lose the bad weight, and we put on the good weight. We do. We put on his attributes. If you, if you go over to, to Colossians chapter 3, you'll see a, see a lot of that. Touched on it a little bit last week. But in Colossians chapter 3, remember it's that now what chapter of our Bible, how we get rid of all these negative attributes, these things that slow us down, loading us up with guilt and baggage and embarrassment and shame. And, and we, with God's help, we, we, we put to death that old overweight person, overweight with all the ugly stuff and the bad stuff, and we replace with, with uh, a, a new man who, who's doing all these good things, has added love and peace and virtue and kindness and all these Christ-like qualities, and, and we're, we're decreasing, we're getting rid of the bad, we're eliminating, but we're replacing it with the good. It's not just enough, is it, to kick the bad stuff out of our hearts and lives and get the bad words out of our vocabulary and the bad thoughts out of our brains, but, but we get to replace the, the bad with the good, and we're replacing bad weight with good weight. We're replacing worldliness with godliness, and it really is a wonderful way to go through not just 2016, but the rest of the time that God privileges us to have in this life. Remember Second Peter 2. The image there is of a newborn babe. And what, what, what job does a baby have, really? A baby has one job, and that's to grow to increase, to gain good weight. And we, we're all on that same journey with God. We're, we're all some stage of development. Those of us who have been Christians for a very short time, we're, we're little babes, spiritually speaking, and we have a lot of growing to do. But whoever the oldest and the maturest among us is, has been a Christian for the most decades, we still also have, have a lot of extra weight to put on, extra godliness to put on, all these virtues. We continue to feed on the Word so we may continue to grow. Growth is a sign of life, isn't it? Whenever a plant stops growing, it's probably going to die. Whenever a child isn't growing, we understand there's a problem. We've got to get some help. We've got to get them to the great the physician, right? So we, we grow. You remember this woman... In John 4, comes to Jesus there at the well, and, and uh, she's carrying this big water pot, and that's heavy, and it's hot, and that's her big burden, and she meets Jesus, and they talk about her past, and, and she's not just carrying a water pot, she's carrying guilt of sin, she's carrying a bad reputation, she's carry, she, that lady has, you think you got issues, that lady had issues, but Jesus loved her anyway, and he, he removed that burden from her, and you remember whenever she leaves him to go back into her hometown to brag on Christ for a time, she leaves the water pot, she has exchanged the, 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 the dead weight, she's exchanged this bad weight for Christ now, she's carrying something better, and remember Jesus in, in Matthew's gospel, he promises us that, that he, will, he will give us a burden actually that, that is light, and he'll give us a yoke that helps us to, to carry this, he actually gives us rest, and so we think about the weight of the world, and that really is cumbersome, that really is burdensome, but when we think about the weight of Christ, we think about something, according to him, it, it's, it's light. He, he gives us this cross not to, not to drag around as a ball and chain, not as some kind of dead weight, but it's a, it's a cross that we lift up. It's like a banner. We're, we're proud of this. We're proud of Jesus. We're proud of his love for us. We're proud of our relationship with him. We just got to tell everybody about Jesus. We, we can't hush about him. And we carry that. Is it heavy? No. It's a heavy responsibility, but it's not a heavy load for any of us. And think about what, what Jesus did when he's on that cross. You agree with this? The, 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 I would suggest that when he's on the cross, he is the world's heaviest man. 
He's the world's loneliest man, even his father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Because his son is so heavy now. His son is overloaded with, with my sins and your sins. He's bearing literally the sins of all humanity. The sin that, that Cain committed when he, when he killed his brother. The sin that Saul committed when he persecuted the church. The sins that I've committed. The sins that you've committed. He's carrying every one of them on his shoulders in his heart when he's on that cross. He had to get that so we could get rid of that. He had to drink that cup. He had to feel that weight. And his father, remember Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, talks about how sin separates us from God. And at that moment, the sins that his son is weighed down with, our sins separate the father from his son. And he did that for us. So if he's willing to do that for us, then what should we be willing to do for him? We should be willing to follow him wherever he goes. We should be willing to, to go wherever he sends us. We should be willing to have the kind of vocabulary he wants us to have, the kind of wardrobe he wants us to have, the kind of worship he wants us to have, the kind of respect to our fellow man that he wants us to have, the kind of peacemaking ability that, that he desires us to have. We, we do that. We, we, we take on that, that good weight, that, that good life, all those wonderful virtues. We do that for him. We don't want what Christ has gone through to be a vain thing, to be, a, to be something that was useless for us. We want what he went through when he took on all that sin. We want that to be something that has some, some benefit for us. We know there are, future, there are future generations that will be blessed by the sacrifice of Jesus. We know there have been earlier generations blessed by the sacrifice of Jesus. But, but we're this generation. And this generation needs to accept that we've been accepted. We need to believe that, that Jesus has done this for us. He has loved us so much that he took it all on. He took it all on so that we could get rid of it. So that we could let go of it. You know, it really is as simple as this. Every sin that you and I have ever committed is going to be paid for either by Jesus on the cross or by each of us in a devil's hell. And Jesus has said, let me do this for you. Let me do this for you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Remember when he is instituting what we call the Lord's Supper. He's saying, drink this cup, which represents or which is my blood. Shed for you for the remission of sins. Why did he drink that cup? Why did he allow his body to be brutalized? So that we wouldn't have to suffer like that. So, so we wouldn't have to pay that kind of high price. And so if we will get rid of the weight of sin. If we will give it to Jesus. And let his blood cleanse it from us forever. Then we really can step into eternity. And in eternity the weight situation changes up a little bit. I'm thinking about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. The, the apostle Paul there, he talks to us about this, this eternal weight of glory. Eternal weight of glory. That's going to be a good thing. That, when you think of eternal weight of glory, you think, oh, that's something pretty heavy, and I don't sure want... No, that's... Think, think of it maybe, maybe this way. What, what did Jesus say are the words that we will hear when we're being ushered into heaven? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. So he's talking about a weight here. He's talking about something in eternity where we're full of glory, but it's also something where we're full of joy. What's another way of saying full of joy? Joyful. Joyful, full of joy for eternity. That's the weight of glory. That's the life that we have. And that's a good weight. That's a good weight that can never be taken away from us. What is that? You know, there's this thing about this bad weight. What We, we eat something, we say it's a, a moment on the lips and a lifetime on the hips. All right? That's a, that's a bad deal if you think of, of a kind of weight I can never get rid of. This is a kind of weight of glory, of joyfulness that, that, that can never be taken from us. It, 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 can, it can never vanish. You know, these days, we have our moments, right? 
We have our moments when the joy is so great and, and the smiles are so broad and the peace is so... Fa- but it, it's not a permanent thing many times in this life. We have the ups and downs. We're on cloud nine, but sometimes we, we go down to cloud minus nine. We have the mountaintop, and then we're down in the valley. And we have the brightest of days, and sometimes we have the darkest of days. That's called life. That's called life. But Jesus promised us through the Apostle Paul an eternal weight of glory. Eternal is an important word. Inter- eternal means it, it lasts. It's something we'll never lose. And it is something so precious and so special. So let's do what we need to do to lose the bad weight. It, it is time to lose weight. It really is. To lose the attitudes that, that break God's heart. To lose the, the words. To lose the behavior. Again, it's not just enough to lose those things. We've got to replace them. I've, I've talked to a lot of people, just like you have, that have effectively broken bad habits. And, and it's not so much as breaking a habit as it is replacing a habit. And we replace the bad, the, the junk food of the world, with the wholesomeness and the wonderful things of God. And by the way, there's some that may not have been here this morning. Would you, would you go to this beautiful picture that I, I showed us this morning? Can you, you want to see that one more time? You seen anything like that more encouraging in your entire life? For those of you that were not here this morning, those are some of our brethren in the Philippines recently had some flooding there where they worship. And, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe it was tempting to say, well, you know, I think it's going to be a little damp today. I think it's a little bit uh, whatever. And so I'm just going to stay home. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go to the, this other congregation up on a hilltop. Why are they there? Why are they there? I mean, because it's easy? No. Convenient? No. You, you think, they, they, would they have gone to hell if they had not gone there? Probably not. Why are they there? I, I think it's probably because that, that lady there on the, the front to the right, she knows that lady in the blue needs her there, kind of dependent on her. And they're, they're pals in the kingdom. They're part of the body of Christ together. You think they're, they're going there because... Uh, because Somebody's going to get upset with them if they're not there. Preacher's going to call them, say, where were you? How y'all doing? You know, you need anything? It seems to me that when you go there and you actually wade into the worship service, you got something special that, that Jeff Abrams wants to have. Some of you wonder sometimes, you know, Jeff, why do you, why do you, go, to, why do you go to Ukraine? A lot, a lot of reasons and, and why you helped me go to Ukraine. I'm so thankful for that. But, but today, if you're Facebook friends of mine, you may already have seen this. But today, in, in Kramatorsk, Ukraine, um, it was Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Celsius was 29 below. Fahrenheit, that equates to about 20 below zero. 20, and that's, that's not counting the wind blowing. I've been there when it's been pretty cool and like that. And you walk out of the church building in the morning and I'm not a, a crybaby as a general rule. It happens. But tears would come into your eyes and they'd fall down to your, your jacket. And by the time they hit your jacket, they become little ice cubes. That, that's pretty breathtakingly cold. And, and I talked to the, one of our preachers there this afternoon named, named uh, Volva Pazi, Vladimir Pazi, great guy. And I was asking him how church went, and he, I'd seen on the weather that had been real cold, and he said, he said, had a good crowd, talked about the people were there, and he said, y'all remember Sister Anna? She's, what, 90-something now? She'd say, 90, none of your business. She's there. She's there. I mean, why is she there? Is she going to not go to heaven if she says, all right, Lord, it's 20 below, and i got to walk? I think I'm just going to phone this one in. I'm going to stay home read my Bible. Let somebody else water the fire. She gets up, she puts on all those layers, and she gets out there, left foot, right foot, and she goes. And, uh, you see, I, I need people. We talk about these witnesses that encourage us. That encourages me. Doesn't that encourage you? Well, let's, let's do ourselves the favor. <laughs> let's, let's give ourselves this gift as we launch out together as a church, and we've got a lot of guests. Thank you for being here. But we launch out together in 2016. Let's give ourselves this gift. We've got a choice every day. I can think about the people that won't wade through water to worship God. I can think about the people who would never go out in, 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 in 35 degrees weather, much less 20 below weather. I can think about that, and I can get depressed about that. I can get aggravated about that. I can think, what do I need to, what do, I need to do to help improve that situation? 
And you can too. We all can think about people that just challenge us at several levels and, and discourage us. But and, and I've seen that in the church sometimes, haven't you? I've seen, you might have a congregation of 400 wonderful servants. you got two that aren't. And sometimes those two people will, will distract our thinking and, and, and discourage some people. And the two almost offset and overwhelm the good being done by the others in the minds of some people who maybe are looking for reason to be discouraged, looking for reason to quit. Why would we judge the Lord's church by its runts? You remember illustration I told a long time ago to some of you about this <laughs> this fellow, he, <coughs> he visits a the pig farm, and, and he, he, he um, sees all these impressive pigs, and he buys one, and he's just really enamored with it and all that, takes it home. He's actually the preacher. Preacher, why did preacher need a pig? I don't know. He brought, bought a little pig and proud of it, took it home, and he bragged about this, this, uh, this pig to his neighbors and so on, and that caused him to think good things about this farmer and the kind of pigs that he raised. And the way this story goes, this preacher hears later that this pig farmer is, is criticizing the church, throwing off on the church, bashing the church, saying bad things about the church. Why? Because there are one or two members in the church that aren't what they ought to be. And so this aggravates the preacher, so he makes another visit out to the pig farm, and he, he says uh, to this farmer, he says, I want to buy another pig. And so the farmer brings out, parades the best and the, the biggest, strongest little piglets he's got there, and which one you want. He said, no, I don't want any I want your scrawniest. I want your, your runt. I want to buy your runt. Why do you want to buy the runt? He says, because, sir, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this runt, and I'm going to take this little scrawny pig, and I'm going to take it throughout the community, and I'm going to tell people that's the kind of pigs you're making out here at this farm. And they're going to think bad. Farmer's saying, no, 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 why, why would you do that? Why would you, why would you want people to... You're way ahead of me in this illustration, aren't you? Why would you want people judging my entire operation by, by one run. Well, why would, why would a preacher, you understand, why would a preacher want people judging the entire congregation by, by maybe the, the, the run? You know, let's, the apostles at times had a run or two. At times, the church is going to have a run or two. Maybe it's me, maybe it's you sometimes, Okay. But we don't, we don't want to judge the church by, by those of us who might be going through some particular struggle and are engaging in, emba in embarrassing behavior. And let's not let the, the runts motivate our thinking and affect our mood. Most all, this is the truth in my estimation, most all the members of the Lord's church are extraordinary people, really. Flawed people but special people, people who do try to have good resolutions, who, who do try to fulfill them, who do try to, to be a blessing. Why shouldn't I let those people uh, be the center of my thinking when I think about the church? Why, why shouldn't I let those people enhance my mood rather than maybe a runt or two uh, degrading and depressing my mood and affecting my relationship with God? What's the saying that if, if I let a hypocrite become, if I let a hypocrite come between me and God, who's closer to God? That hypocrite is closer to God than I am. And so let's, as we move forward, one of the ways to do this, to get rid of the dead weight and to, and to replace it with the good weight and the good attitudes and all that, it is to, is to fixate again on the people who are getting it done, the people who are doing it well, the people who are persevering, the people pictured who are, are waiting in water in the Philippines, the, the people who, who walk through snow and slippery ice to worship in, in Ukraine and, and other, other places like that. You know, when we see things like that, I know that there, there's a there's a, a touch of us that a part of us that just wants just kind of I'm just so ashamed of myself because I complain, I whine, I don't have anything like that to deal with, and I get that. But but let's let's rise above even that. Let's not be ashamed of our moaning and complaining and all that. But let's just be thankful we get to be in God's family with people like that. And by the way, there's probably somebody that looks up to you just like. We look up to those folks in Ukraine or those folks in the Philippines who do that. There probably is somebody. Maybe there's lots of somebodies who you're an encouragement to. 
You're a, you're a blessing to. I tell you, you're sitting there thinking, oh, all right, who who would I be an encouragement to? Here's one name, Jeff Abrams. I mean, I'm even thinking more important names than mine, but really, you encourage me. You encourage. Me. I see Ruth Warren walk in this building. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. I see some of you single folks come in with, with your kids and you don't have help from I I'm encouraged by that. I see some of you limp in and limp out. I'm encouraged by that. I see some of you sign up to be involved in, in downtown Bible. Your your effort encourages me mightily. It helps me to not fixate on, on those who, who are not as energized as, as maybe you are. I see somebody out there pulling weeds, and I'm thinking, you know, I ought to be the one pulling those weeds. It encourages, it encourages us so much. The things you do, it encourages me. It, it glorifies God. Let us not be weary. In well doing, for we shall reap if we faint not. That's as true tonight as it was the day Paul penned those words to the churches in Galatia. Do not be weary in well doing. We don't have much longer to go, you know, maybe a few minutes, maybe a few months, maybe a few decades. Compared to eternity, we don't have much longer to go. Let's take our spiritual vitamins. Let's get rid of the dead weight. Let's run looking to Jesus. Let's think about these, these witnesses. And let's together, let's cover up. Let's stay together. Let's not let the devil uh, separate us in any way. And let's focus on Jesus. And let's get to the place. Let's get to where he is. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we are so thankful for a Savior who has blazed the trail for us, who has been the author and finisher and continues to be author and finisher of our faith. Help us to look to Jesus as we run, as we get ourselves involved in all these marvelous verbs of Christianity. Help us, Father, to be cheered on by the witnesses. Help us to, who, to be benefited and uplifted by the applause of heaven. And help us, Father, to be applauding for others and encouraging them as they, as they move towards, towards greater faithfulness. Help us, Father, to resist the tendency to focus on the negative and the people who have, uh, have a discouraging way of living. But help us to see the stars among us, those who, who do the little things, who, who do the big things to be a blessing. Father, help us to be that for somebody. Help us to be an encouragement for another person or maybe lots of other people. Help us, Father, to be thankful. We get to be in your kingdom with people who, who stand in water to pray, to worship, who walk down very cold and slippery and dangerous paths in order to worship with their fellow believers. Help us to be motivated by that. Help us to be refreshed by that. Help us to look forward to hugging those folks in eternity with you. Father, help 2016 to be the best year of our lives, at least spiritually. Help us, Father, to get closer to you than we've ever been. Help us to get closer to your people, to your will for our lives than we've ever been before. If we need prayers of the family tonight, help us to seek them. Help us to be humble about that. And, Father, if we have yet to put on Jesus in baptism, help us to, to give him the weight of our sin, understanding that his shoulders are bigger than ours. His blood can wash away what our blood can never wash away. Help us, Father, to become his child, his disciple, this evening in the waters of baptism. We love you, Father. Thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.